Hi folks and welcome to Tech Talk. My name is Anu. My guest today is Gary Oliver. He is CEO of a company called RazorThink. Come join me. Hi Gary. Hi Anu. Thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you. Likewise. Yeah. So you are CEO of a company called RazorThink. RazorThink is an enterprise AI systems company. Tell me about RazorThink. Yeah, so we're a software company and uh, we help enterprises become AI driven enterprises by building a platform. It's called the Big Brain Platform and essentially accelerates the building and deployment of intelligent solutions. So what does that mean? Essentially it automates most of the functions from data science functions. So everything from digesting data, in, ingesting data, doing the data wrangling through building of the models and the algorithms all the way through deployment to the infrastructure. So we help companies inject intelligence through AI into every element of their organization. Um, what really sets us apart, makes us different, is we can visually build through drag and drop, we can visually build deep learning architectures. This is sort of the newest area of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We can do that in a very rapid manner. Mm -hmm. um, also what sets us apart is the fact that not only are we um, perfect for data scientists who have PhDs, and are today using open source tools and other mechanisms to build artificial intelligence, but also for those domain experts who don't necessarily have those same skills, who wanna be able to just load data into the system, have the system automatically determine the right model or algorithm to use for their particular use, select it, fine tune it, and ultimately deploy it into production. So really a single platform for enterprise to rapidly build and deploy intelligence solutions. So why is it that RazorThink has such broad applicability across a wide range of companies? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think if you look at all industries today, artificial intelligence is going to have impact across every single function and process of the organization from understanding their customers better, their wants and needs, and making sure they're serving them correctly. Also, how do I sell my customers more goods and services based upon their particular needs, so which customers are most likely to buy which products, how to support them better, so that when they have a problem that you're really anticipating the kinds of problems that they would like. And it also has the ability to disrupt many industries. There's a lot of industries now where the lines within industries are starting to blur. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that a little bit as we go here. But what we built is really a horizontal platform mm -hmm. that allows any company in any industry to rapidly create intelligent systems. Mm -hmm. This includes both the PhDs and data scientists, as you know, are very difficult to find today. Mm -hmm. It allows them to sort of supercharge their work by, by automating about 60% of their tasks. But it also allows domain experts mm -hmm. and novices to use through an automated capability, the ability to just do drag and drop um, building of intelligent systems, all the way from ingesting the data, wrangling the data, building the models and tuning the models, and ultimately deploying it out to the infrastructure. So. Um, as you know today, every company is trying to find data scientists. They're very expensive, they're very hard to find. And for those that have them, we basically turbocharge their role, right? Allow them to do more with better predictions in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And for those that are domain experts that want to start to do some of this, we actually allow them through the platform to also build intelligent systems. So it really covers every industry, every company size. Um, it's, very, it's a very exciting time. Uh, for artificial intelligence. That's interesting. So how many different um, industries could this disrupt? Yeah, I would say that um, it will act, it will have an impact on every industry. Um, really, if you think about artificial intelligence, it's about making better predictions. Sure. So everybody wants to know better, what are my customers' needs? How do I, com how do I better compete with my competitors out there, right, to get to market with the right product? How do I make sure that the product meets the market? How do I automate and fine tune a lot of my back office processes? So really, any industry is gonna be affected by this. Um, for us, because it's also a kind of the shiny object thing where you wanna go chase whatever looks interesting, we started out by focusing on the financial services industry, so mainly banks and insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And really from everything from understanding their customers um, in terms of upsell and cross-sell and how do I generate more revenue by understanding the behavior of my customers to be able to offer them goods and services, to things like churn, which is how do I keep my customers that are very valuable to me mm -hmm. from leaving me? Mm 
Right. So we can an analyze the behavior of those customers and start to predict those customers that might be thinking about moving mm -hmm. so that the bank can engage them and try to make sure that they're happy and to stay with the organization. To things like fraud, both credit card fraud, mm -hmm. network fraud. In fact, we're doing a project right now around, um, we're looking at video from ATM machines mm -hmm. where bad guys come in and put a skimming device in an ATM, mm -hmm. which collects information, you know, it collects the card information from their customers and they take that away and then they can use that card information to commit fraud. We're actually analyzing video in real time to determine which of those people that walk into the ATM are actually gonna commit the fraud by looking at their movements and behavior. Oh, so, so it really impacts everything from the front end of how do I engage yeah. my customers to support, to internal processes, um, all the way through uh, the organization. Sure. So what are the industries, what are the different industries thus far that have been receptive to the Razor Think solution? Well, first of all, it, the, the platform itself is applicable to any industry. It's a horizontal platform. Um, we happen to choose financial services, banking, financial services, insurance, as the first industries to go to market with. Um, in their case, it's an industry, number one, they spend a lot of money on technology. Uh, secondly, it's an industry that's being attacked from fintech players and smaller firms that are coming and trying to pick off elements of, for example, the bank. There's a lot of digital disruption that's happening. So the whole notion of digital banking is something that every CEO and board is trying to figure out how to transform the bank from a digital perspective. And so we see the ability of AI to really help make that transformation to kind of a digital banking environment and to help them keep and hold off some of the folks that are coming to try to take off pieces of their business. So from that perspective, it's everything from how do I get to know my customers better so I can serve them better? How do I upsell them additional pro products? So for example, a bank that has 30 million customers and has a new product offering, if I have so many salespeople in the organization, which of those 30 million customers should I be focused on trying to sell this product to? Through AI, we can actually look at the behaviors of all of those 30 million customers and do what's called micro-segmentation. We actually come up with a set of segments where each of those customers, it's not so much demographics, but it's segmented by their unique behaviors. And so that's, that micro-segment of customers actually tends to behave the same way. Therefore, they would respond to an offer or a new product the same way. And where it actually gets kind of put into use is that you have salespeople that are contacting very specific customers that the AI would serve up to them, and it actually identifies the message to give that customer to make them want to buy the product. That's an example of growing your revenue, right? Kind of upsell and cross-sell. The flip side of that is things like churn. In banking, 15% of the customers of a bank tend to churn every year. It's very, very expensive, right? It's much easier to try to keep a customer than to try to get a new one, right? And so kind of the flip side of that equation is based upon looking at patterns and behaviors, which of my customers' behaviors are such that it looks like they're trending towards either not using as many of my services or potentially leaving the bank altogether. So it's kind of the, the flip side of that same coin of how do I engage them with offers and reach out to them to make sure that they're happy, they're fulfilled, and that I can provide them with the things that they need to remain customers. From that then, it really extends into a number of areas, such as credit card fraud, network fraud, and a whole lot of back office automation. Um, we have something we call uh, intelligent document processing. A lot of large banks and insurance companies have a bunch of forms, right? And this is the ability to take and scan any kind of form in, and actually the, the AI will read the form, understand the context of the form, actually know when there's boxes on a form, it'll understand the context of that, and actually know what the actual information on the form means. And then it can actually take that, interpret it, and spit it out for use in other downstream systems. That's kind of an example of a back office process that can be, that can be automated um, from that perspective. So uh, financial services, banking, insurance companies are really, you know, kind of the first uh, foray that we took from an industry perspective. But this technology is applicable to all industries, all segments, and all functions and departments within organizations. A few moments ago, you talked about it sort of automating the job of a data scientist. Correct. How does this manifest? Yeah. Uh, so if you think about what most of a data scientist does, they're having to deal with massive amounts of data. So it's kind of wrangling the data, getting the data ready to put and build models. And then from that, they have to determine what are the right kind of models or algorithms to use with that data. Again, these are massive amounts of data 
with lots of different variables, yeah. it's hard to get that inside of your head. And then you have to start to test things. You've got to tweak and tune and adjust what are called the weights and parameters as you start to look at what is the appropriate algorithm or model for that particular job. And then when that's all done, you have to figure out a way to take that model, that set of, of capability, and then deploy it to the infrastructure to put it into production. What RazorThink does is we automate the data wrangling process all the way through the model building and fine tuning process all the way through the deployment. So what does that leave for the data scientists? What it leaves for them is to be able to go in and tweak and tune using the platform. If they want to do coding themselves, they can actually code and inject the code into the platform. If they want to understand what kind of code is being developed automatically by the platform, they can actually look at that code and go in and change the code themselves. So it really allows the data scientists to be way more productive and most importantly allows them to focus on their domain expertise around their business. Right. right? They're going to know the business better than any AI system could. And so it allows them to really focus on the highest value parts of data science and take a lot of the really difficult mundane pieces and automate that. And as I was saying, even for those that aren't data science scientists, yeah. they can ingest the data automatically and the, the, the system will actually determine what the appropriate right model is, mm -hmm. pick that for them, and allow them to deploy that. So again, it, in a single enterprise, we have a single platform that runs everything from domain experts all the way through your most technical data scientists to be able to do this. And one of the things that's becoming a big issue now in corporations is around governance. Mm -hmm. So I've got all these things that are happening in pockets of the organization. How do I make sure that I'm having appropriate governance for the models? Right. Who owns the model? Who has access to change the model? So inside of our big brain platform, we have the ability to do all of that model governance, including access rights, things of that nature. So it allows you to sort of govern all the activity that's happening and also to have reuse of those models. Yeah. So if someone in Department X did something around a certain area mm -hmm. and someone in, in Department Z wanted to leverage that, they can actually go in and then leverage that same capability to kind of accelerate their building of artificial intelligence for their business unit. Gary, what are some of the complex, difficult business problems that are being addressed by RazorThink? Yeah, let me give you a couple examples. One, this happens to be with a very large credit card company that we would all know the name of. One of the things that they're challenged with is trying to identify network fraud. One of the hard things about network fraud is it doesn't happen that often, and you have to be able to identify patterns over a period of time. One of the things that we do is called deep learning. And in fact, we can do a combination of machine learning and deep learning in these very sophisticated deep learning architectures. Um, while it's very powerful, we actually do it in a very drag and drop way. So you can create these architectures using literally drag and drop methodologies. One of the things that deep learning is able to do is it can actually identify patterns and make predictions that a human didn't have to know about what to look for to begin with. So you feed it a whole bunch of data, and through a number of these various models, it can start to look at things like interesting patterns that don't happen a lot together, but actually happen sporadically over time, mm -hmm. and then to be able to predict when it's gonna happen again, or what are the, what's the nature of that kind of fraud, for example. That's one that's it's particularly difficult. Another one we're doing right now is called AI Assisted Customer Service. Mm -hmm. And that's one, um, this is another organization where they have 10,000 customer service agents there's a lot of turnover in that profession. People get frustrated, sort of like air traffic control. Mm -hmm. They're very stressed out because customers call in, they want answers. In this case, there's all of these uh, policies and procedures and very detailed documents that exist within the organization. And a customer is asking a pretty new employee a very hard problem. Mm -hmm. And through a combination of machine learning and deep learning, we're able to come back with a very specific answer for that customer service agent. This is something that traditional machine learning could not solve. So it's really a combination of leveraging machine learning and deep learning. Mm -hmm. I also talked about some of the areas, I mean, you've probably seen recently where um, an artificial intelligence capability could detect cancer, yeah. skin cancer, better than a skin cancer doctor could. Kind of a funny conversation. My son is actually in medical school right now. We were yeah. talking yesterday. He hasn't yet selected his specialty. And one of the questions we get all the time is around, you know, what elements of, of medicine is AI gonna replace? Sure. And I think this is true in general for most professions. Um, it's not gonna re replace the skin doctor, but it's gonna allow them to come up with a diagnosis much faster so they can spend the time with the patient, of get course. to know the patient and figure out what to do next. Yeah. 
Same is true with cancer detection through um, you know, radiology, things of that nature. Uh, deep learning systems are able to detect cancer actually in many cases better than a human being would. And so it's really a way to supercharge that person's yeah. job by giving them the information. You can imagine a patient walking in to a doctor's office with some symptoms that the doctor maybe hadn't seen before. But very quickly through data that exists around the world and artificial intelligence, it can say, hey, we saw these 20 sim similar cases in Asia a month ago, and here's what the diagnosis was, and here's what the, the treatment should be. So sort of, again, providing this as a benefit to supercharge the individual. So when we talk about expert AIs, yeah. this is what our system produces, we call expert AIs. Think of that as the smartest person around a given function yeah. in your company yeah. sitting beside you right. as your sidekick. As opposed to somebody who's taken over your job. Instead of someone replacing <laughs> yeah. you, it's someone who, just like if you think about today with Siri yeah. and you know Alexa and all these different capabilities, you ask information, you maybe look up the weather or flight information or travel information, yeah. It's not replacing you, it's just augmenting your capability, right? And making you more productive. Same is true with artificial intelligence. It's really about providing better predictions faster so that companies can be more effective and compete. Gary, as you are aware, well aware, there are a fair amount of large companies in this space. Talk about the pros and cons of being in this sort of a competitive environment. Yeah. You know, one thing we should realize is this market is just its very infancy. Uh, most companies are still just playing. I, you know, there's a, a, a kind of a saying saying we got to take AI from the lab to the to deployment, right? There's a lot of testing and things of like like that going on. Certainly, there's some of the really big companies like IBM. We all seen the ads on TV for Watson and beating Jeopardy and things of that nature. And that was actually, I think, good for the overall marketplace. It gave awareness to the marketplace. It got people to understand what was possible. So, you know, that's a really a goodness, I think, um, uh, from some of the big big players. I think the advantage that we have is that we have both people in the company that have had a lot of experience in large, medium, and small companies. So the expertise and understanding of how to serve really large enterprises. All of our customers are the largest companies in the world, but yet we have that speed equation. You know, we're a smaller company, we communicate quickly, we can move on a dime, and that gives us the advantage. In addition to that, the way we've architected the big brain platform it's very modular. So if a new capability comes into the marketplace or a new technique, we can very quickly grab it and literally drag and drop it onto the platform. We can do it literally in a matter of days. And we've seen that several times with customers where they want to take advantage of something they've seen and we can go out and literally create that and drop it into the platform very quickly. So we're nimble, but we've also, both as an organization and a culture and an experience level, but also in the way we've architected the technology. Um, so, you know, we're, there's, there's more market than, than all of us can handle. Um, and so we're really excited about the future ahead. Of course, of course. Now, Razor Think has a triple digit growth rate. Why is it that there's so much interest in this platform yeah. at, at this particular stage of the market? Yeah, I would say it's probably not just us, but many of the AI players. I think several of them are growing at high levels. We're also growing at extremely high levels, which is exciting challenging at the same time. Um, and I think it's because, as I was mentioning, companies are starting to see that AI today is actually practical. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's because of a convergence of a number of things I've, I'm sure you've heard about, which one is the amount of data that's available coming off of websites, coming off of sensors, coming off of customer information. So the, the vast amount of data, and data is the fuel for AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, the more data, the better. Sure. Okay, that's one thing. The second is, is that the processing power that's available now, both on premise and also in the cloud, is actually something that companies can afford. It used to be that only the biggest national laboratories could buy these supercomputers to process this kind of data. Now it's available by the hour on, on a number of cloud service providers, right? And the second, or the third I should say, is these new algorithms, things like deep learning. So all of a sudden you're able to um, unmask patterns and identify things you could never do before that a human couldn't do before. So when you bring that together, there suddenly corporations are realizing this is for real. Mm -hmm. And as I was mentioning before, the fact that it literally has the ability to impact every single element of a business. My, my dumb analogy is if a company is kind of like a brick building, AI is like the mortar between all the bricks. Every single part of a company, you can insert intelligence. Right. Okay, and so what you really want, our belief is you want a single platform 
to allow your organization to be able to very rapidly craft intelligent solutions to inject into those various uh, parts of the business. So that, for us, equals opportunity, and that's why we're growing at such a fast rate. In a market, again, that's literally just getting started. Most, most of the customers that we originally came upon were doing things like chatbots, you know, kind of the front-end chatbot. Um, that's just, that's touching, the, that's scratching the surface. I mean, really where the value is, is really in a lot of the back office processes and things about making companies more competitive. At the same time, I would say that the disruption that's happening is blurring the lines of various industries. And some of them are, are heavily under attack. We talked about financial services and insurance. Banks particularly under attack from FinTech and other small players that are coming and trying to bite off pieces of their business. I'll give you one example of a very large um, company in India. Mm -hmm. They happen to be in the telecommunications space and we've, we've worked with them uh, quite extensively. They've rolled out their cell service and network to 200 million citizens in India. Now you'd say, okay, that's great. Now they're in the cell business, right? They're, they're in the communications business. Right. No, 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 they're not. That conduit to the end customer is now a channel. And what they're doing yeah. is they're offering them entertainment. They're offering them healthcare, access to healthcare. They're giving them microloans. They're offering them payment mechanisms, right? They're education. This that's, is a telecommunications that's, company yeah. that's now disrupting many, many industries, sure. okay? And so I think that most companies are realizing unless they harness the power of artificial intelligence, they have the potential, it's the old disrupt or be disrupted kind of a, a scenario. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah, very insightful. Uh, sure. Um, I'd like to switch gears okay. and talk about your background and your upbringing. Well, very, very quickly, up, upbringing, I, was, I was, uh, grew up in Southern California. I was one of four kids. Mm -hmm. Grew up down near the beach. So um, pretty much if I wasn't in the water surfing or, or on the beach when I wasn't in school, I was playing various sports. And that was kind of my life up in, to college. Uh, I, uh, I ended up uh, going to UCLA. I actually married my high school sweetheart. We've got four beautiful children of our own. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in college, I actually got an internship with IBM and started to work for them directly out of school. Uh, my initial background was more in the sales and marketing arena. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting more into the product space um, within that company, and then had a really fun opportunity to come to a very large credit card company and manage IT for the insides of the company. So I've really had an opportunity to be both on the side of a provider yeah. to large enterprises, but also being the guy that's buying products from these guys. Um, one of the things that's different, um, it's a strength and a weakness probably, about me and a lot of the, the CEOs of startups is I'm always surrounded by people that are more technical than I am, that come from more of a technical background. But the way I leverage that is from my years as being on the other side as a customer, when someone comes and tells me about feeds and speeds and capability and function, my first answer is why do I care? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what is it gonna do? Is it gonna drive revenue? Is it gonna make my customers more happy? Is it gonna allow me to, to get additional market share or profitability? Unless someone can translate the features and functions of a capability into what it means for me from a business perspective, I just don't care. And that I think has really allowed me to ask those kinds of questions even in, in a, the companies that I've been part of, part of managing. So that's something that I, I really enjoy. So um, kind of to, to, to finish on your question. So then I went from very large companies to mid-sized public companies to uh, smaller companies and startups. And I really enjoyed that. As startups are, are a mile a minute. They're, they're a lot of fun. They are, they are. So what would be your best advice to the CEOs out there when it comes to overcoming adversities yeah. to create success? Well, every founder or CEO is going to run into adversity. We like to sometimes talk about every startup, you know, and even large companies hit brick walls going 200 miles an hour. And the question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay on the ground? Are you going to get up and dust yourself off and find a way either over the top of the wall or around the wall, right? Um, so most importantly, I think, is really believing in the core of the product or the solution of the marketplace that you're trying to serve. If you don't believe in it and that doesn't come out of your pores when you're talking to investors or customers, no one else is going to believe in it. And that's kind of number one. I would say the second thing is that the initial business model or focus of the company a lot of times does not become the final focus or business model of the company. So you really have to learn to adjust and expand and pivot as needed. Um, and so kind of that conviction 
of what you're trying to do, but also the flexibility and openness that when you get to a certain point, you may see information or opportunities that make you want to pivot. And in many cases, we kind of jokingly call it the drunken walk. From the beginning of the starting of the company to where you ultimately become successful, it looks like a, a drunken <laughs> walk, right? Because you're, you're doing this, you're trying yeah. to figure things out. Um, and this is true for you know, so many of the companies that they, they kind of coin a phrase, you know, the, the 10-year-old overnight success, where everybody knows of the company that went successfully IPO or got a big investment or had huge growth rate. In many cases, what they don't realize is there were 10 years before where they were doing the drunken walk, trying to figure out what the right magic was to get to that point. And so that's the main thing. Uh, the other thing I would say um, from my experience is, you know, hire the best possible people and trust them. You know, hire better people that are better than you, that have different skill sets than you, because building out that team is so important, especially for a CEO or, or a founder. And really trust those people. Give them the ability to be creative, to be innovative. Don't micromanage them. And in the process, they're going to blossom and, and grow, and the company's going to have that flywheel effect. And as CEO, it's going to really allow you to focus on the strategy and the customers and the things you want to do to try to propel the company while you let the folks that you built in the team really help drive the company forward internally. So those are a few, a few tips over many years of doing this stuff. Gary, thanks so much for being on the show. It was wonderful meeting you and hope to see more of you. Um, folks, thanks for joining us today. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.